Yeah. Hello, hi, my name's uh, Dr Paul Fields. I'm here at the British Society of Haematology in Edinburgh and I'm a consulting hemato-oncologist at Guy's Hospital in London. I've really enjoyed the conference and there's been some really interesting new presentations on the treatment of um, lymphoma here at the conference. And I'm here with a colleague, uh, Dr Andrew Davis from the University of Southampton, who gave a presentation this morning in our lymphoma communication session where he described a new agent in the treatment of relapsed and follicular lymphoma. I'm going to ask Andy what his thoughts were uh, about the new drugs, particularly in indolent non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, Andy. So, Paul, I think it's, I think it's a really exciting time for, for follicular lymphoma and for new, for new therapies. I think there's a whole range of different agents, uh, those that may be affecting cell surface molecules or those that affect dysregulation dysregulated pathways mm -hmm. in follicular lymphoma mm -hmm. and maybe those th that affect the microenvironment which is mm -hmm. we know is absolutely critical as a driver in follicular lymphoma. So you know over the last years we've had data on the effectiveness of the lenalidomide and in the obviously the, yeah absolutely and obviously the R squared regimen yeah. where perhaps the rituximab augments yeah. the natural killer cells ability to perform ADCC in the you know mm. so so, so I that's think a new combination so that combination. that combination is exciting with very high response rates yeah. you know reported you know we can see you know fantastic molecular responses pet responses etc so I think R squared is 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 very promising and obviously in the relevant study which is a a randomized study between R squared and R chemotherapy, mm -hmm. then that's going to show some really important results. So I think that little is really interesting yeah. in follicular lymphoma. Yeah. Yeah. The story about abrutinib, which is the BTK inhibitor, mm -hmm. and how that's evolving in follicular lymphoma is, is one that is probably an unanswered question mm -hmm. yet. Mm -hmm. So we know that we've got great data in mantle cell lymphoma and in CLL yeah. with yeah. ibrutinib, yeah. but the studies with follicular lymphoma there's one reported where the response rate is perhaps less mm. than one would, would have seen with mantle cell lymphoma. Mm. So I think that's evolving with mm. ibrutinib, but I think that's going to be important. Mm. Um, we see different monoclonal antibodies. Um, we don't know yet whether the effectiveness of a second generation anti-CD20 such mm. as obinutuzumab, mm. which has been shown to have uh, you know, superiority in CLL, whether that's going to be useful in follicular mm. lymphoma. So we'll wait and see so what the Gallium really study, mm. yeah. It seems a lot of these drugs in CLL are being translated to non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and CLL field is slightly ahead in some of these compounds. Absolutely, and I think you know, we've got the PI3 kinase yeah. whole group yeah. of, of inhibitors and, yeah. and PI3 kinase is again dysregulated in B cell malignancies and has an effect on you know, proliferation, cell survival, apoptosis, ap apoptosis adhesion, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I think there are a number of PI3 kinase inhibitors and of course there are isoforms of PI3 kinase. Mm. So there's the, um, the delta isoform, which I was talking about yeah. today, but also there's a number of other agents. Um, one That's like the alpha. Alpha okay. or pan PI3 yeah. kinase. Yeah. So copanlisib, um, there was a presentation was. about it the was. effectiveness of copanlisib in, in a range of B-cell malignancies. So there's a lot of drugs that you can choose from. Just focusing more on the presentation that you gave this morning, yeah. which you specifically focused on idelisib in relapsed refractory non-Hodgkin's. What, what are your thoughts? To me, there's a lot of issues that when you see a novel agent, the efficacy and the toxicity, what, what were your thoughts on, on background yeah. to your presentation? So um, I was talking about idelalisib, yeah. which is a fairly, you know, it's a highly specific delta inhibitor yeah. of PI3 kinase, so one of the, one of the isoforms. Yeah. Um, it's orally active, yeah. um, and I presented data on a phase, single arm phase two study, because in the phase one study, there was some evidence to suggest that, that this agent, idelalisib, was going to have utility, hopefully, in indolent non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. So and this was a paper that was written up in the New England Journal. That so, so this, I presented an update of the data that yeah, was presented. Yeah. So this, this yeah. study that I presented, the update yeah. of it, I is a single arm phase two study of oral idelalisib. Yeah. Um, which is given twice a day at a dose of 150 yeah. milligrams. Yeah. And the key thing about this study is it was focused entirely on patients who were refractory to rituximab and an alkylating agent. So every patient had either progressed whilst receiving rituximab and an alkylator or had relapsed within six months 
of having completed yeah, therapy. Which is key for this group of so a very difficult group of patients. Very difficult. And some of the patients have also had fludarabine and bendamustine as well. Absolutely. So, so the whole repertoire of drugs they seen. Yeah. So, so I think I think sixty five percent of people have had bendamustine yeah, previously. Yeah. Uh, Eleven percent had a stem cell transplant Trans previously. Yeah. So we recruited one hundred twenty five patients as part of an international yeah. collaboration. Um, uh, the last patient was recruited in October 2012, so I presented an update of the study. And what we saw was that uh, overall response rate was 57%, with 10% of patients achieving a complete mm -hmm. response, which I think is a really impressive overall response for this, rate. For this, this very heavily pre-treated group. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely right. Than the pre mm. And that duration of response was some 13 months. Mm. So I think it was you know, really... So prolonged responses. Yeah, yeah fascinating. Yeah. Yes. So, so you mentioned overall response rate, yeah. um, which is highly significant for a heavily pre-treated group. So what about the other em important endpoints of progression-free and overall survival? Yeah, so there were... Um, I mean, the median time patients were on treatment for was about 6.6 .6 months, right. with a mean of about 10 months. But some people had had 36 months' worth of treatment. Drug. Yeah. yeah. Um, and the progression-free survival was um, 11 months. Yep. But what was really interesting is, is the progression-free survival of their prior therapy. Yep. So that, yep. was a, that was median of just 4.6 months, yep. whilst the progression-free survival of the next regimen of idelalisib was 11 months. And you, you, know, you remember so that old data. So I have line treatment, double the double. Well, you, you know, as it's a median of four pre, yep. pre yep. therapies. Yep. But you remember yep. the old data with chemotherapy yep. that we'd seen from Bart's and other places yep. that the number of response you know the more times you've had treatment the shorter your duration of response uh, so this uh, is a new changer really so it's actually, you know, prolonged to prolonged reverse that I think is yeah, really exciting yeah which and would not be totally unexpected given it's working through a novel targeted biological yep. pathway and not the chemo pathway yep. so that really is is remarkable really yep. and what about the overall survival in the group in the, as a whole was is that I um, haven't got a direct comparison yeah, yeah. with that, you know, obviously, but the overall yeah. survival of the group of the whole was some 30 months. Yeah. So it's pretty, you know, pretty so impressive. And, and the deaths have been almost entirely due to progressive disease. Progressive disease. So, uh, so they get good prolonged responses. Have there been any toxicity quality of life issues with giving this, being, given they're very really heavily pretreated? Have you seen an increased incidence of infection or even side effects such as colitis, which has been described sure. in this group? I mean, so the major adverse event that has been reported was diarrhea, stroke, yeah. colitis, and actually 50% of patients at some point during their treatment did report an, an adverse event related to diarrhea, stroke, colitis. The reason I use colitis in brackets is because actually not all of them had a formal diagnosis yeah. but had, had right. diarrhea. Well, but the number of patients who had severe mm. colitis mm. was obviously relatively small, and it was about 24% mm. mm. of patients. Mm. Uh, we know that those patients responded to cessation yeah. of the drug. Yeah. Um, and then actually, of those patients who came off drug, mm. actually you could safely reintroduce the drug mm. in the majority of patients mm. with some dose modification mm. when everything had settled down. What, what was key, though, about the diarrhoea yeah. is that actually we saw onset at a range of times. So on average, the, the onset is about seven months right. after initiation of treatment. Yeah. But actually, we saw patients who developed colitis a year or you know, a late. year, even 18 months after initiating treatment. So I think it's really important to remember that yeah. when so you're prescribing it, yes. that actually it's not, it's not an immediate effect like we may see with some other pathway inhibitors. Yeah. Actually, it can, be, it can be many, many months later. So it can be later. very late. Yeah. And the patients critically can still be on the drug and they can be just having the drug with no, and suddenly this side effect can occur. So, so it's, a education, it's yeah. education to the patient. Yeah. They need to know what they yeah. need to do yeah. if they get diarrhoea. Yeah. And obviously us as physicians need yeah. to know how we should respond yeah. to the diarrhoea yeah. and always have it in our mind, even yeah. though the patient's been happy for the last 18 months. But critically, you can rechallenge with a lower dose. You can rechallenge, yeah. And do you see? I've, I mean, I guess it's too early to tell, but do you see a reoccurrence of the side effect? Of it? So, so, so about half the patients who have been rechallenged have been rechallenged successfully. Right. right. And what about other side effects? After effect? having had, I should say, grade three or four toxicity. toxicity. So after having had severe yes. toxicity, yeah. So the, we've mentioned the colitis, but then the other commonly reported um, uh, adverse e effect here could be the abnormality in liver function tests and. 
uh, it's, it's commonly reported for this, particularly grade one and grade two. What's your view? So I think patients who develop grade one or grade yeah. two yeah. transaminitis, you yeah. know, elevation of ALT, yeah. AST, those patients were safely yeah. continued on, yeah. on the drug. It was only those patients who developed grade three or grade four yeah. transaminitis yeah. that the drug was stopped, and that was 18 patients right. in total. Yeah. Settle down, mm -hmm. um, and with reintroduction of idelalisib, again at a dose reduction, three quarters of the patients didn't have any recurrence of this adverse event. So I think you know we are aware that it causes a degree of transaminitis. Yeah. We need to keep an eye on it. We know how to to deal with it, yeah. and stop it, but can safely reintroduce yeah. if it occurs. Sort of take home messages that patients can still remain on the drug even though they're getting these adverse yeah. events, and you yeah. can rechallenge the patients yeah. at yeah. a lower dose. And uh, I mean, we saw some um, we saw some hematological toxicity yeah. associated yeah. with it. You know, there are some numbers of patients who have a decrease in their neutrophil count, and yeah. there are patients who have a small number who have a decrease in their mm. platelet count. Um, it was interesting in the entry criteria that quite a few patients that entered the study with their bone marrow function. Was yeah. So, so I think this is really important. So, yeah. th so the neutrophil yeah. count cutoff was lower than one would expect. Yeah. The platelet count cutoff was. 50 for allowing you entry into to take the drug for a novel agent yeah. trial, yeah. and yeah. I think that that just represented the fact that these were a heavily pre-treated yeah. patient population, um, and therefore it's great that they were they were able to go into yeah. the study. Yeah, that's very very important for a group that have had four or five lines of treatment, yeah. things like fludarabine and yeah. bendamustine. Okay, that's that's very interesting. So it really is showing promise this agent in the relapsed refractory setting, and obviously this is delta PIK three kinase isoform inhibitor, but there are other class inhibitors in this group that are coming through yeah. and I having just seen been chairing the session there's also uh, there's uh, the, the alpha and uh, delta inhibitor what's your thoughts on the other class compounds in this yeah. group so I mean I, I just to say regarding idelalisib yeah. you yeah. know the delta inhibitor I think that these this is a group of patients where we don't have very much in, in, in a way of conventional treatments to offer yeah. so I think the responses and the duration of responses that we've seen in the study that I just presented I think are really I important agree. I agree but the whole field of PI3 kinase yeah. inhibitors yeah. is really one that's exciting in B-cell malignancies. So um, there was a presentation about copanlisib, which is a pan-PI3 kinase inhibitor, but has particular activity in alpha and delta isoforms. Yeah. It's an IV preparation given day one, eight, 15 of a 28-day cycle. And, and George Follett's presented data from the study looking at both indolent and aggressive yeah. lymphomas, yeah. demonstrating some very clear responses yeah. and um, uh, you know a good safety profile. Yes. Um, interestingly, there was no colitis yes. yeah. Um, yeah. reported to date. Um, they had an inst they had a side effect with high glucose levels. That's absolutely right because I think you know the the alpha yeah. a part of the pathway is involved in insulin homeostasis. Yes. You know yes. glucose homeostasis, I should yeah. say. And so there were some patients who had hyperglycemia. But once again, result. they could re-challenge them. Uh, absolutely. Well, they treated them with insulin, yeah. and it was kind yeah. of a, a very early effect and didn't, and didn't recur. Long, yeah. So there were responses clearly in patients with follicular lymphoma, yeah. but other uh, subtypes. Yeah. So that was very interesting. But yeah. also, there's other PI3 kinase inhibitors coming through. There's an agent called duvelolisib, which instead of being selective for alpha or delta, alpha or delta or, or pan, this is selective for gamma and delta. Right. And again, we're seeing clear yeah. responses in patients yeah. with follicular lymphoma. Yeah. So how all this is going to put yeah. together is going to be gonna really ask, fascinating. I was going to ask you that question, yeah, because we've got these wonderful new drugs, which previously many of these patients have had chemotherapy, and these drugs are being used, obviously, in the relapsed refractory setting. But obviously, the idea is to try and keep these patients going as long as possible with the quality of life. Mm. How do you see the field moving forward, given the evidence of all these different compounds? Where do you, where do you think it will move forward that so I think as a whole? I think we've got a lot of work to do yeah. in order yeah. to work out which patients will benefit yeah. from which um, type of, of PI3 kinase yeah. inhibitor, yeah. or actually any, any of these new agents. Yeah. And I think that will come from us being able to better understand the biology yeah. and for us being able to better understand an individual's patients. Restratify, tumor. restratify the patients. That Absolutely diagnose. right. So I think you know yeah. we've got these fantastic yeah. response rates yeah. of uh, idelalisib in a difficult patient yeah. to treat population. Um, we're now looking at that in combination with rituximab and bendamustine in yeah. a randomized phase three yeah. study, and also in combination with rituximab in patients with relapsed indolent lymphomas. So I think we're looking at the yeah. potential for combination with chemotherapy. Yeah. There are clearly a lot of potential to put these together yeah. with other novel agents exactly. 
but what we've got to do is we've got to clearly understand the preclinical science so that we make sure we make rational choices about our combinations. And or, balance or it against toxicity. Yeah, absolutely. And, and because these agents are going to have different toxicity profiles, yep. we've got to find the, the right toxicity profile. And another point would be a lot of the patients that we're seeing who are down the road with their previous therapies will be elderly patients with comorbid conditions on other drugs for other cardiovascular disease, pulmonary disease, so those side effects and toxicities which are unknown really, yep. the interruptions will need to be studied. Absolutely, and I think only through more careful clinical evaluation are we going to be able to, to, work, yep. to work this out. Yep. But I, 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 you know, I think it's a really fascinating and hopeful time. Yeah, I think so as well. It's very exciting actually to be a lymphoma doctor. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, We're absolutely. very lucky and very fortunate. Yeah, thank you for joining us here at the BSH. We've had a wonderful conference and I hope you enjoyed our discussion about all these really exciting agents in non-Hodgkin's lymphoma.